Welcome to the second day of the environmental impact assessment course. Um, I see there's a comment. Yes, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so I would like to welcome everyone. I think there's still some people arriving. We are currently 32 participants, um, but that's okay. And um, I want to jump right into the lecture of the second day <clears throat> of the environmental impact assessment uh, class. Um, and I want to start with this figure. Um, th this is a um, CO2 clock, which actually visualizes in life how much of the CO2 budgets is left in order to um, fulfill the Paris uh, 1.5 degrees of, um, Paris Climate Agreement. And so with the current emissions of CO2 um, of about one ton or 1,331 tons per second, we would have seven years left to use up the carbon budget. And this just um, visualizes actually again, how, um, how important and imminent it is that we, um, that an economic change takes place if we want to stick to the, to the commitments that have been agreed to in the Paris um, um, Climate Agreement. <clears throat> of course, you can withdraw from the, uh, from the agreement, but, um, but then you would have to um, think about the consequences that the scientists have been um, warning of as we discussed yesterday. <clears throat> so um, yeah, so this is just as a background information. Um, about the climate but the gas budget. So linked to this, um, in Iceland, um, there are several incentives where um, anyone, students, concerned citizens, can submit research proposals or um, projects that they would like to do in order to um, help Iceland become carbon neutral. And the next deadline is in a few days, on the 10th of December. Um, so those of you who are interested, um, I recommend that you um, take a look at this link here. Um, <clears throat> um, RANIS is the Icelandic research agency that funds research in Iceland. And if you have a brilliant idea for a master's thesis or a PhD project after your, after your master studies, you can submit project proposals um, through RANIS and the next call is specifically on um, climate action um, projects. <clears throat> so um, yeah, so again, if you have any questions or comment or would like more information about something, um, feel free to post it into the chat of the Zoom group um, or, um, or just write me a mail and we can um, discuss it afterwards. So today's objectives um, in this second day is that everybody gets started with their project, um, that we will discuss interdisciplinary thinking, um, how to look at environmental issues from different perspectives, identify environmental threats, assess environmental impacts, um, argue factual, know where to get the information, develop consent building capacities, teamwork, writing and presenting, and, the, and, and, and to enjoy your work. Those are the objectives I would like to get you started with, with the, um, with the project. And maybe just to make sure that everybody has a project, um, I think Yang Shu, you prepared a poll to, 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 um, to see how many people have already a project and who is still looking for, um, uh, um, who is look, still looking to join a group and um, who has a group and but would but is looking for people to join them. So I would like you to fill this out just to see that 80% um, of you have voted so there are still um, a few more people that can vote. Mm -hmm. um, so we see that at least 13 of you have already a group and are complete, 14. And there are uh, about half of you 
or exactly at the moment exactly half and half are looking for a project so this is um, what I suggest that we do in order to um, help people who are looking for a group and um, people who would still are looking for members maybe those of you who are um, taking the lead of a group that is not yet complete could write into the chat um, the, the, the project topic and um, how many people are still needed in the group so that those who are looking for a group can then um, look at the chat and contact the person who is um, who is still looking for person for a group members of course you can also do this in private you can um, but I guess it's good it would be good if those who have a group Okay, Young, you, so you're now you're sharing the results, right? Yes. Okay. Everyone has voted. Okay, everyone has voted. Okay, there are still, I think there are still a few people, um, students who did not join yesterday. So um, if there's someone here who did not join yesterday's course, the idea is that we create um, groups of six persons or six students that work together during the next three weeks on an environmental impact assessment project. And so um, most of you or 16 students have already formed a group and uh, the group is complete. And the others still can, are still, some of you are still looking for members and um, some of you are still looking for a group. So. Um, one way of doing this is by simply typing into the Zoom group chat the topic that you would like to investigate. And, um, and in this way, you can promote your project and attract maybe new members. Um, so if young we cannot see who answered right young shu can you see no no we can we cannot see who who answered okay so how should we do this we could make um okay what we can do is so those of you who have already a group um you can click on the link below this is a short youtube video it's only about four minutes long um and you can which summarizes environmental impact um, assessment um, so, and those of you who are still looking for a group, you can now, during the next four minutes, um, contact people or write into the chat that you would, um, that you have a project idea, um, so that we have, um, that, um, yeah, so that we can then continue with the lecture after four minutes. So, let's give... Um, let's give maybe those people who are still looking for a group uh, about four minutes to find a group and then at quarter past ten we would start um, we would start with the with the lecture we would continue with the lecture oh yeah thanks for sharing the link so it's, yeah, I understand that you cannot link, click on the link, but you always have the links also in the slides that are in the Dropbox. So if you are specifically interested in looking at the video afterwards, you can always click on, um, go to the Dropbox, find the slides from today, and then you should be able to access the link directly. So we have, um, so there's, there's um, Stefan Eckert and Temu. They are looking for um, group, uh, people who are looking for um, um, a project or a, or a group. So um, I think if I remember correctly, they, are, they would like to look at the environmental impact of 
drilling, uh, Arctic drilling for petroleum, which is a very complex project um, uh, with, uh, with a lot of uncertainty and um, it might be a bit difficult to get data. So you might consider, um, consider to somehow um, limiting yourself to certain aspects, but um, at least, yeah. Okay, they are also, I mean, of course, you're free to choose any topic you want by the end of the week, but um, I see that someone is looking for a group wrote in the chat, so there are still um, three more spaces left, and otherwise, um, Yeah, so I'll leave you maybe um, two more minutes and then we would continue, or three more minutes and then we would continue with the, with the lecture. I see that there's a new group formed with um, Stefan, Enkit, Ekit, Temu, Orvar, Chloe. That could be a, um, a group. Um, so for me, uh, yeah, okay. Um, Yang Shu, could you maybe give them a very short, uh, maybe for two minutes, uh, a breakout room to um, to Ekit, Temo, Orvar, Chloe, yeah, and, and Stefan? So, but please, uh, um, let's make it like two minutes so that we just to, so that you can um, discuss it very shortly and then we will continue with the, with the lecture. David, I think you are the host and I am the co-host, so I think you can do the break. Uh, break oh, off. Okay, so, how how would I have to do this? Uh, there are more and uh, broadcast rooms. Yeah. Um, assign thirty-one into one room. Manually into um, create rooms. And so add room or oh, add the room assign Very good. Okay. So then we're going to continue. So those of you who have already groups, maybe you have watched this, this short video, which summarizes more or less in a nutshell what uh, the, the lecture of this morning. But I want to go a little bit more in detail what is expected for those of you who are really into it uh, and would like to learn more about the details of this lecture. Today's lecture is mostly based on this book, Introduction to the Environment, Impact, Environmental Impact Assessment. I think the book is available in the Reykjavik University Library. Um, there's also part of the book are in the Dropbox. Um, just look for um, Glasson. Um, and I think it's 2012. Um, uh, you should find at least the first part of the book um, as a PDF copy in the Dropbox link where you can read up 
some of the aspects we discussed this morning in more detail. <clears throat> of course, there are some other books that I also used um, or where I sometimes took figures from, um, but most of the figures and most of the topics come from this book, um, um, Introduction to Environmental Impact Assessment. I also added the page numbers to the slides. So if you're interested in a specific um, um, figure or topic, then you can go directly to the book and read up um, uh, um, the details about, about the, the topic. Mm. So today's lecture is structured into seven parts. Uh, first, I'm gonna go over legislation and principles, then the project and the process of environmental impact assessment, then team functional unit and baseline bo boundary, um, project uh, baseline and system boundary, screening and scoping, understanding and documenting. This is more or less, this is um, like the inventory that you have to create. This is probably the biggest part of an environmental impact statement when you collect all the information and put it all into tables to um, have to describe what your project is about. And then there are different tools we're gonna look at where you can interpret the impacts, for example, life cycle assessment or impact identification. And then we're gonna look at evaluation and mitigation. And finally, the involvement of the public and because this is an important part of an in, in, in environmental impact assessment that you inform the public and you consult the public about your, the project outcome of your project. <clears throat> so first I'm gonna start with the legislation and the principles. And um, maybe we can have a short, um, maybe you could, all those of you who want, could maybe write in the chat in your own words what is for you environmental impact assessment? If you just write a very short answer to this question into the chat, because afterwards we're gonna look at the definitions, how legislators defined environmental impact assessment and how it evolved over time. So anyone who would like to give an answer to this question, what is environmental impact assessment? Okay, if, you, if no one uh, would like to uh, give an answer to this, in the classroom, it's a lot easier to have these discussions, but online you would have to just type it in here. But I'm just gonna give you the answer and I would like to start with an example of, an, of how environmental impact um, can work. And this is a picture, um, uh, you probably recognize the skyline with the beautiful snow covered mountain in the back, which is Mount Fuji. So those, maybe someone has recognized this, but this is Tokyo city, a, a huge city of 17 million people. And this is a typical view that you have today, but it has not always been like this because just 40, 50 years ago, um, the view would look like this. So this was a few years ago, 2016, but in the 1950s and 60s, the typical day looked like this. It was a city covered in smog due to air pollution and um, Tokyo has really gone through a huge change due to environmental impact assessments because every single project in Tokyo goes now through an environmental impact statement. Okay, so we have a, uh, okay, we have a, actually a few answers. The evaluation of possible projects in terms of impact of the environment. I think that's a, uh, um, yeah, this is a very good definition the study of future ramifications of any project time on the local environment. So, um, so in the second the, um, definition, there's already the future in it, which, may, which, has, a, which has a projection in it um, into the future. And then the third 
definition, the throughout review of the environmental impact of a proposed project that endangers all relevant stakeholders. Um, in the third definition, you have the term throughout, th thorough, thorough review, um, which may, might go more into this holistic um, approach that you look at it from different, uh, from, from different sides. And I'm gonna come back to this um, afterwards when we look at the definitions. But to come back to the example I was um, talking about before, air quality. And um, so you have it, um, so, so this is what I was kind of de describing before. Tokyo city went from a city that was polluted like this, like here to something that where the, the, the sky is clear again and where people can see the surrounding mountains on a clear day. But this was of course a tedious process so um, at the beginning in the 1970s, environmental impact assessments were only necessary for public works. Um, it, it then got standardized in 1983 and 84 into a full legislation. So every bigger project had to go through an environmental impact assessment. Um, in 1997, in 1997 and then I, an environmental impact assessment law was an, enacted. And then in the year 2000, um, diesel vehicles were banned. Um, and then further legislations came into place in order to protect the, um, the um, pollution into the environment. What I wanna point out is that the legislation of environmental impacts um, went through a transformation while in the 1970s, Legislation was usually described as an impact on the environment and on man, man's health. So there was no, um, the, the, the idea of um, planning ahead was still missing in the definition and also this holistic approach that you look at the economy, the social impacts, the environmental impacts, and maybe also the cultural impacts were also still missing um, at, the, at the very beginning of um, environmental impact legislation. Mm -hmm. um, um, by the 1980s, this changed and the, and, and the environmental assessment became something that is a technique and a process which included the temporal as aspect into it, where you not only identified the impacts, but also looked at it of a, as a process that goes over um, um, a period of time. And as you have seen, for example, for the example of Tokyo, this went on over several decades. Um, if you look at the st strategy behind the environmental um, legislation, then um, this involved the entire process of a city transforming into something that is more um, environmentally friendly. Um, in the 1990s also came um, um, the legislation included this notion of planning ahead, making projections, maybe simulating um, impacts. So um, the environmental impact status, um, statements became more and more um, complex, involving also um, computer models to predict impacts and um, uh, uh, to see how a future project might impact on, on, on the environment. Um, and, um, and then by, by the year 2009, the International Association for Impact, um, for impact the International Association for Impact Assessment um, described the environmental impact assessment as as the process of identifying, predicting, evaluating, and mitigating the biological, social, and other relevant effects of a proposed development prior to major decisions being taken and com commitments made. So this is more or less what is um, also today in the environmental impact assessment framework of the European Union, um, where you have this notion of um, predicting evaluating and mitigating, and also this notion of looking at the um, project from different sides, from a social side, from an environmental side, and also from an economic side. Mm. 
So these definitions are all described more in detail in, in the book that I mentioned before. And um, obviously every state in the world um, has its own way of describing environmental impact assessment processes. Um, but almost every country nowadays has some legislation that includes environmental impact statements. Uh, was there a comment? So if you would like to comment or uh, write a question, just feel free to put it into the chat protocol. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so as you can see on this world map, most countries have some legislations that describe a way how environmental impact assessments have to be um, um, made in order to have a project, um, um, get the permission to go ahead with a, with a project. <clears throat> Also over time, the number of environmental impact assessments increased. And um, as you can see here, this is also directly from the book again, uh, some statistics. Um, for example, in Austria, um, while in before 1990, there were maybe four environmental impact ass assessments made. And by the year um, after 1999, um, the the, the number of environmental impact assessments multiplied times five. <clears throat> you can see, for example, Sweden, they have a lot more projects. Um, so these are just rough estimates and um, it's probably also outdated. Nowadays, there are a lot more projects um, um, probably undergoing environmental impact assessments. <clears throat> um, but it shows that there was an increase of number of environmental impact assessments done um, since um, over the years. Mm -hmm. um, since Iceland is part of the European economic area, um, I wanna give a short outline how the environmental impact assessment directive works within the European Union. Um, so within the European Union, there are three legislative uh, bodies and one is the European Commission. The European Commission um, proposes legislation which is then ratified um, by, by the European Parliament, which is elected by, um, by the citizens of the European Union. Mm. So the European Commission is the executive body of the European Union. It proposes the legislation. Um, it also funds research. So the way it works that the, the, the commission funds, for example, Erasmus and research projects um, and the Horizon 2020 projects also, or also the Green Deal incentives are funded by the European Commission and based on the research legislation for the European Union is proposed. The proposed legislation goes then to the European Parliament and um, and then the parliament can ratify the legislation and then it becomes legislation. <clears throat> so, um, so just to recall, remind you, European Union is composed of 27 member states as shown here. Um, the United Kingdom, Kingdom has left the European Union by the 1st of January, 2020. Um, is there a specific... Yes, we're gonna go into the ISO 14001 for uh, environmental impact assessments um, next week. So we will look at the certification of environmental impact assessment next week. Today, we're just gonna look at the concepts and the general setup for your project um, within this course. <clears throat> um, okay, so the, there are 27 member states of the European Union because the UK, United Kingdom has left the Europe, uh, European Union. But this is what I was mentioning before. Um, there are three legislative bodies in the European Union. One is the European Commission, which is in principle um, hired experts um, by the European Union to fund research all across Europe they propose initi initiatives for legislation. 
the European Parliament, which is directly um, elected by European citizens, ratifies these suggestions from the European Commission. And then you still have the Council of the European Union, which is in principle the ministers of different governments from member states of the European Union. <clears throat> And if the Council of the European Union and the European Parliament ratifies it, um, the legislation, then it becomes European law, which, for, which can be, for example, a directive. And the directive has to be implemented by each member state into legislation, um, um, into national legislation. So for example, the directive on environmental impact assessments from the European Union is a binding document where Iceland has to implement into the legislation of Icelandic law um, this directive. The Icelanders are free to choose the way the environmental impact legislation is implemented into national law, but they have to adhere to the guidelines of the directive that comes out of the European um, um, legislative process. <clears throat> so if you have any questions, please feel free. Otherwise, I'll just continue talking uh, and um, try to explain what is um, on the slides. Um, yeah, of course, there's also the European Council. These are in principle the, the heads of, of, of states of each government. So this is more um, like foreign policy um, concerns more the foreign policy. Then maybe the other two entities of um, the European Union is the European Court of Justice and the European Central Bank, which, um, um, which, is, which has the same role as national banks in each country, which um, um, makes, makes the monetary policies for the European Union. Mm. Um, Iceland is a specific case because Iceland is not a member of the European Union, but Iceland is in the European economic area. Um, the European economic area is composed of Iceland, Norway, and Liechtenstein, a very small country between Switzerland and Austria. And um, so the good thing about this European economic area is that Iceland can participate, fully participate in all um, European research grants. So the Green Iceland can participate in the Green Deal in Horizon 2020, in Erasmus programs, as many of you are maybe um, um, enjoying right now, because you can come from any university in the European Union and come to Iceland and even get some um, subsidies from the European Union to travel and to study in Iceland. Mm. However, being part of the European economic area, um, doesn't allow you to have any members in the parliament because only um, full members of the European Union can have a, um, parliamentarians in the parliament and um, discuss with the European Union the legislation um, suggested for the European Union. <clears throat> so yeah, so that's just an important fact um, because Iceland, yeah, uh, has a um, special status. The European Economic Area um, has also their own programs like the EEA grants or Norway grants where they have their own um, research grants which might be a um, benefit of not being in the European Union because then together with Liechtenstein, Norway and Iceland they have their own funding schemes for exchange and for research projects um, of course at a smaller scale. Um, but this might be a, um, another important benefit of being in the European economic area. Mm. Um, okay, so, okay, so the binding body from the European Union um, is the Environmental Impact Assessment Directive. It was created in 1985 and like we've seen before by the definition, in 1985 it was mostly a mandatory statement that had to be done for long railway lines, motorways, um, airports, 
um, with the with a certain distance and installation of disposal of hazardous wastes and 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 big water treatment plants for example they had to undergo a mandatory environmental impact assessment in the 1980s mm. what was also implemented already in the 1980s was this screening procedure the screening procedure is a is a document that you hand in before you hand in the actual environmental impact statement where you just screen your project and argue why an environmental impact statement is needed or not, which you submit then to an environmental agency and they tell you then, okay, your project needs a full environmental impact statement or your project is exempt from, from an environmental impact statement. I think in Iceland, it's, um, it's something like 50 kilowatt, for example, for small scale hydropower. If you have a small scale hydropower for a farmstead that is off the grid in Iceland, uh, and the, this small scale hydropower has less than 50 kilowatt hours, kilo, kilowatt uh, capacity, then you don't need an environmental, go through an environmental impact assessment. You can simply um, get, a, a, get a, a license to operate the, the, the small-scale hydropower, but you don't need to go through a full process. But if you build a bigger hydropower plant, then you would have to go through the full process. And the decision comes out of this screening procedure where you hand in a first statement, or maybe it was nine, maybe it's, it's 10 megawatt. And get probably you're right. And, and I was maybe mistaken on the um, maximum capacity. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, the, the screening procedure is the first document that you hand in, in order to find out from the national agency if you need to um, go through an environmental impact um, procedure or not. So the directive was amended in 1997 and 2003 and 2009 with various different um, um, additional directives and additional legislations. One important aspect that it, that it became transboundary, that it became, gave, gave the um, directive a transboundary context. So if you, if you have a project that is just at the border, for example, if you build a nuclear power plant just at the border um, of, of your country, then you would have to take into, a, into account what happens outside your country as well. Um, for example, Austria, there, there are a nuclear power plant is just across the border building Czech Republic. And when they submitted the environmental imp impact statement, they had to take into account the risk and the environmental impacts on the other side of the country, of the country's border. And this was implemented in, with the directive of 1997. And, um, and, in, and another important directive is the Aarhus Convention in 2003, where the right of information was granted to the, uh, the, to the general public. And so this, this convention gives the public the right to information. So if anyone wants to build the big factory, they have to make the plans public so that any concerned citizen can look into the plans and see and see what's happening, and then um, come up with objections or concerns that have to be addressed within the environmental impact statement. Mm. Um, so yeah, and then in two thousand nine, um, there was an amendment on um, adding projects projects related to transport, capture, and storage of carbon dioxide. Um, so this is especially interesting for Iceland because this made uh, it mandatory for environmental impact assessment for projects like the Cartfix project, for example, where you, um, where you mineralize the CO2 emissions from a geothermal power plant that are being re-injected into a well head and mineralized in the ground. Mm. So this is mostly all uh, legislation from the European Union. Um, 
and um, yeah so if you're more interested in the legislative text feel free to read through it or um, google this up um, but my main point within this lecture because this is not a, a lecture on legislation it's more on the environmental impact statement is to um, use the directive as a guideline for your environmental impact projects that you're going to be working on and there are seven key areas that I would like you to think of and take into account when you write your environmental impact statement. They are also described in the environmental impact assessment directive of the European Union. And the first key area is simply the description of the project. It's kind of an inventory where you simply describe the project, um, um, the size of the project, what it is, how big it is, who is involved, and uh, what is concerned. And then you break down the project into its key components. For example, the construction, the operation, and the decommissioning. Um, if you think about a, a petroleum platform in the Arctic, what is needed to construct it? What, is, what are the dangers during the operation? And how do you get rid of it? And how do you decommission it at the end of the, of, at the, end of the um, um, operational phase. <clears throat> um, this first step is really the most uh, labor intensive because you have to get all the information together, talk to experts, find out, uh, find out, find, find literature that describes the process and make estimates how much, how big the project is and how much emissions are created and so on. The second um, key area is to describe alternatives. Um, to, so to look into how you could do your pro project in a different way. Um, um, for example, if you had power lines in Iceland, um, there have been various different alternatives being discussed uh, for power lines in Iceland. For example, putting them underground. Um, is this an alternative? Is it possible to put um, power lines underground? How much would it cost? How much additional emissions would be created if you were to create it and um, put power lines on the ground and so on. This would be a typical alternative that could be considered within an environmental impact um, statement. Mm. Description of the environment. Here you list all the aspects of the environment. Um, this can also include the, the baseline. How does the environment look before you start your project? Um, and this is important to describe the baseline because it would also, um, it also shows the status of the environment before the project so that the impacts of your project don't overlay, overlie with other impacts that might, might occur from, from, from other projects in the area. <clears throat> um, so examples of the description includes population, flora, fauna, air, soil, water, humans, landscapes, and cultural heritage, <clears throat> where you just give an overview of the different aspects or different environmental aspects in the area um, that you're going to um, build your project in. Um, yeah, so it's, it's good for, for, especially for the description of the environment to talk to local experts because usually uh, um, the locals, they know exactly what is relevant and what not. So that is um, definitely um, a good um, point to contact maybe local NGOs or local um, environmental groups um, to see what are their concerns and what you should take into account when you write your environmental impact um, statement. Mm. And finally, then the key area four, here you simply describe the effects on the environment. Um, um, it's also an evaluation of, is it significant or not? If you describe something as significant, then you have to define why you think this is going to be significant or not. Um, um, and here, 
obviously there are different methods. So you can use a Leopold matrix. We're gonna come back to this, a weighted matrix, or you can use also simply um, um, thresholds defined by legislations when something becomes significant or not um, is depends of course on the legislation and sometimes also on um, for example Leopold, Leopold matrix is a matrix where you describe the impact and then you give it um, uh, you weigh it by describing the, um, the the weight of the impact on the environment <clears throat> Um, so as an example, for example, if you have a geothermal power plant that emits sulfur oxide, sulfur oxides, then um, sulfur can be more hazardous or can create more health hazards than CO2. So, um, so as I see someone is waiting in the waiting list. Uh, how do I... Um, <clears throat> so um, yeah, so the Leopold matrix is just a way that uh, um, a weighted matrix where you take into account how big the impact is going to be um, uh, and um, give it a, an additional weight if it's very hazardous um, pollutant or not. Okay, then um, and then an important key area that you might also include in an environmental impact statement is the mitigation. What can you do to mitigate the environmental impacts? A typical example is um, carbon um, sequestration with, uh, um, with, with the CarbFix project for a geothermal power plant, where you simply take the CO2, you re-inject it into the underground, you mineralize it, and you reduce the um, CO2 emissions into the atmosphere. <clears throat> Another mitigation could be, for example, if you have a, a drinking water reserve and in order to away, avoid impacts, you fence it off and you try to prevent any pollutants coming into a, a sensitive area by um, protecting it. Um, so, but mitigation is an is a important um, key area where you describe what measures you take to reduce the environmental impacts of your project to a, um, to a midi minimum um, and also might, you might also try to avoid um, certain impacts. Um, the sixth key area um, is a non-technical summary this is especially important with the Aarhus Convention because here you write a summary that is open for the public domain where any, anyone, any concerned citizen can look into it and it should be understandable um, for the general public so that they can understand what the project is about and that they can raise their concerns um, according to your project and then you would have to address as a developer, you would have to address the concerns of the citizens um, based on this non-technical summary that is um, provided to the general public. Mm. Um, so yeah, in case of lack of know-how or technical difficulties, um, you might also inc include a key area in your environmental impact um, assessment that describes the unknown or the te technical difficulties. For example, just coming up on top of my mind, if you were to build a nuclear fusion um, 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 plant, then you might have a chapter on it. What is the unknown and what are the difficulties that have not yet been researched, but you still would like to go ahead with the, the, um, um, the project and then you would have to describe um, what are the uncertainties within, within your project. And this would be the key area seven of uh, environmental impact assessment um, described by the European um, Environmental Impact Assessment Directive. Mm. Um, so 
here's a slide that just describes all the legislation that has been has been generated in regard to um, environmental assessment legislation. And you can see that since the 1970s, numerous directives have been created. So I'm not a lawyer. I think someone of you is a lawyer who might uh, uh, um, know this better, but there, there's just a wide series of different directives, uh, legislations um, uh, and, and, and laws that have been implemented so it's quite complex today to fully understand the environmental impact um, assessment pro procedure. But within this course, we just want to um, um, go ahead with the concept of an environmental impact statement. Of course, we might not be able to adhere to all legislations, but um, it also, this also describes why you frequently need in such a process an, uh, um, uh, an expert in, in, in national law and, in, and maybe also European law to, to make sure that you take into account all the legislation that is relevant for an environmental impact assessment. Mm -hmm. The basic steps of an environmental impact assessment process is that you start out with a screening. Like I mentioned before, in the screening process, you describe your project, you hand in a first report to the national agency and they will tell you if you need to go ahead with a full environmental impact assessment process or your project is too small, like for the small scale hydropower up to 10 megawatt in, in, in Iceland, um, there um, you would not go through a full environmental impact assessment. So uh, a screening pr um, report is, is, is sufficient so that the national agency sees that you um, fulfill the criteria that are not, that you don't have to go to a, to a full environmental impact assessment. Mm. In the scoping document, which is usually a second document that you hand in, um, you look into each, and the, each individual topic that you listed in the screening a, a little bit in, into more detail and you assess which one is relevant and which one is not relevant. Um, you might have, um, for example, in an area where water is abundant, like in Iceland, you have a lot of precipitation, up to 20,000 millimeters precipitation per year. Water shortage might be less relevant than in an area where um, water of water scarcity, maybe in, uh, in the Sahara in, in Africa or in, a, in the desert, um, there water scarcity might be a lot higher. So in the scoping document, you assess a little bit what impacts are relevant and which impacts are, are, not, are not so relevant. And based on this coping document, you describe then um, the environmental impact, you make projections um, and you, you fill out your full environmental impact statement that you submit to the nat national um, agency. The, age, the national agency um, is typically the agency that then evaluates your environment environmental impact statement and gives you the permission to go ahead or says, look, you have to go back and address the, um, and this and this uh, topic more, in more detail. <clears throat> when you hand in your environmental impact statement, the public has the right through the Aarhus Convention to look into your plans and into your developing plans. And then they can say, look, you're trying to build this geothermal power plant, but this will target one of sensitive area. They can point this out. And then the, it's up to the national agency to decide if you as a developer should write an additional report on a specific project. And, 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 then, um, and then you have to go back and look into that topic more in, in detail and, um, and perhaps have an additional chapter on some specific um, aspect. So usually this goes on for a couple of months, but the public um, in an interactive project, uh, um, process, um, usually for the developer, it's an advantage if they interact with the public early at the early stage of the project because then they can include the public and anticipate concerns of the public at the start of the project. If you already start um, 
planning your project too far in and then all of a sudden you have the public that is that uh, that um, disagrees with your project and starts to write petition and um, um, and protests against your project then um, your your project is in a difficult stage and the national agency might be under pressure to ask you to provide additional documents um, and go through a more intense environmental impact assessment process. <clears throat> but typically, once you have addressed successfully um, the concerns of the public and the concerns, especially of the, um, of the national agency that evaluates your environmental impact statement, um, um, you give a final presentation that is typically a public and then the national agency um, gives you the permission to go ahead with your project. And in most cases, there is a post-decision monitoring where you continue to monitor, monitor the environmental impacts also after um, the project has been built in order to, um, in order to um, assure that everything, um, that everything that the legislation is in, in place and that, um, that the, there are no um, environmental impacts that occur that were unexpected before. <clears throat> so here I have a few slides in here um, with the environmental impact assessment process for different countries. Scotland, for example, which is of course a European, well, up until uh, um, 1st of January 2020 was part of the European Union and or this is still in discussion how they if they would like to come back to the European Union but anyway um, before they still have this environmental impact assessment process which adheres to the environmental impact assessment directive of the European Union so you have the screening um, uh, report that is written first and then the national agency gives them the permission to go ahead or not then you have a scoping document that is submitted, what key issues need to be addressed. And then you have the public that consults and can read through those documents. Um, uh, and, and environmental impact statement is, uh, is submitted uh, and presented to the public. And then it goes through a review and evaluation and finally through a decision making. Um, this is the process um, in the United States of course, the United States is, uh, um, has a similar um, environmental impact assessment process as the as as in, as in Europe. Um, you could, but it, it's it's described a little bit differently. So you have here the agency that identifies identifies the need of action, which is usually the National Environmental Protection Agency, mm. that asks developer to write an environmental impact. Um, um, statement. And if you look at the procedure here, this interactive process with the, um, um, if, if, this, if the environmental effects are significant or not, kind of corresponds to the screening and scoping process described in the European legislation, where you go first through a screening and argue if a project has to go into an environmental impact assessment or not, and then you describe in the scoping what is relevant or not. And in the US it's slightly different with, um, with, a, with, with this flow chart which describes very well how the decisions are taken. And then once you go into the environmental impact statement, you follow a procedure where you submit your environmental impact statement. The public gets to review it and comment it then there's a fi final environmental impact statement, which is uh, revised based on the concerns of the public. And then um, the final decision is taken if the project can go into um, a, <clears throat> into, um, if you can go ahead with the, with the project. Of course, if the screening and the scoping already finds it that your project is too small to go through a entire environmental impact assessment, then the decision can be taken a lot earlier and you can go uh, and you can bypass the environmental impact assessment process. Um, 
Um, so here is another example from Austria um, where it's all in German, but in principle, it's again a very similar process where you have a screening and scoping at the beginning, and then you have um, consultation with the public, um, and, um, and finally you reach a, 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 a decision if the project can go ahead. The, ma the main point I wanna make with these slides is that the directive of the European Union just describes and gives a directive how legislation has to be implemented, but each country has its own way of implementing the environmental impact assessment um, process. Mm. In Iceland, um, a scoping document has to be submitted to the National Planning Agency, um, which is an agency under the um, under this um, supervision of the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources. And so typically you submit a scoping document where you describe the project you want to do. For after four weeks, you get a decision from the National Planning Agency. And then you have time to react to this decision and hand in an environmental impact statement. And, and then the planning agency um, revises this statement. The public can submit um, concerns and objections to your environmental impact statement while six weeks, during six weeks, and then the environment, the planning agency has time to evaluate the environmental impact statement and uh, comes up with a decision. Um, but in Iceland, the national planning agency has not a binding um, um, saying. It has, it just gives out a opinion about the project. And then it's the municipality which can give the final statement if a project can go ahead or, or not. <clears throat> um, what did I want to say to this? Any questions so far? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so this, I think this changed in 2008 before, before 2008, the National Planning Agency um, was, could give out a binding opinion or a decision on projects. But um, since 2008, the National Planning Agency just provides an opinion, which has to be addressed by the developers. And then the municipality um, has the final word in saying if a project goes ahead or not. But in principle, this adheres to the directive of the European Union. It's just the Icelandic way of implementing the directive into national legislation in Iceland. Um, yeah. So screening and scoping again. Um, yeah, so the environmental impact statement is the document that you finally submit, which should address all relevant environmental impacts regarding your project. Um, I mean, you can read about it, how it is done in the United States um, under the National uh, Environmental Protection Agency. But within this class, I would like you to use um, a very scientific structure for, because we only have three weeks. Typically an environmental impact statement or environmental impact assessment process takes several years, especially for big projects, but Within this class, you only have a few weeks in the, uh, um, to, to write a whole report. So that's why we have to somehow condense the entire process, but, but still to give you um, uh, an experience what an environmental impact statement um, includes all. And, the, and, and therefore, I created the template, which is in the Trump, Trump, uh, Dropbox where you can see what is expected from you in the frame of this, of this course. Mm -hmm. Important is that you have a title page which has author, course, teacher, university, date, uh, date of submission. You have an abstract, you will write an ex um, a, a individual assignment is also to write an abstract, but in the final environmental impact statement, the abstract has only text, no figures, no tables, 
it's only about half a page. It simply describes in a concise manner what your environmental impact statement is about. Then a table of content, then you have an introduction chapter. The introduction chapter should, should include the five W's, so what, when, where, who. Um, you simply describe the project, you review the literature, and in some cases you can also include the theory behind it. For example, if you were to write about nuclear fusion, you might have to include um, some aspects of theory to describe to give the reader enough information what your project is all about. Mm. Important within this class is also that you include a baseline and a system boundary. Um, you want to describe how did the environment look like before you started. For example, um, if you were to look at, um, I, I think a group of you is looking at the, um, at the lockdown so here it's very important to look at what was the baseline before? How much were people traveling by car and plane before the lockdown? And how did the lockdown then impact on the, on, on, on the, on the behavior? Um, the, ba the baseline is important because it describes what the safe situation is before you start your project. And then you can identify what consequences come from your from your project or your um, process or your um, event. Mm. The system boundary is also very important. You want to describe exactly what is included in your project and what not. For example, if you were to write about the nuclear power plant and you exclude um, the construction of the power plant, the extraction of or the production of uranium from the power plant and the disposal then you could have an environmental impact statement that looks a lot better than if you were to include also the extraction of uranium, uh, the construction of the plant and the disposal of the nuclear waste. So the system boundary is important. Obviously within this course, you can exclude um, um, parts that you simply don't feel um, possible to do within the three weeks, but you have to um, clearly stated in this chapter where you describe the system boundary. Um, you might, for example, say that to take the example of before the, the lockdown, that you're only going to look at the CO2 emissions. You're not going to look into the um, psychological effects, health effects, um, um, standard of living effects. You can describe this in a way, so in this way you can limit yourself to the to those top to this topic that you're very that you're interested in. but in the system boundary it's important that you describe what is included in your analysis and what is not included um, this is important because otherwise someone is going to come and say look um, maybe your statement is that uh, um, that that your project is very sustainable but you did not take into account this and this aspect mm -hmm. So the system boundary is quite important. The methods, um, typically you can have different methods. The methods can be very, very extensive. You can have modeling in there. You can have um, um, uh, uh, measurements, chemical measurements, investigations, and so on. But within this course, probably your methods are gonna be mostly literature review and maybe some interviews. In some cases, you might look into some surveys for example, to find out um, how people perceive your project or how people behave, how often do people come by bicycle to the universities. Uh, for example, a group of students made a survey in order to find out how students came to the university in order to assess the, um, the carbon footprint of students at Reykjavik University. So you can have in the methods like surveys, um, simple methods or interviews with experts, but it's probably within the three weeks that you have available, mostly gonna be literature review um, and desk work where you simply gather together, collect together the uh, data 
and then analyze it and put it in, in um, nice results. Um, of course, then important also is that you differentiate between results and discussion. In the results, you just um, report the results. In the discussions, you can give the res put the results in context um, and also provide an opinion how you interpret the results. Um, it's good to separate results and discussion because, um, because then you avoid of having um, then you can be very objective in the results and in the discussions you can add in um, your interpretation of the results. Uh, depending on your project, you might have a disaster plan and a mitigation measures. Um, a monitoring plan could also be very helpful, if, especially for the bigger projects, like for example, a petroleum platform in the Arctic, I guess the, the monitoring plan and also a disaster plan and mitigation measures um, uh, would be very important to um, include in your um, environmental impact statement. Then a conclusive chapter is important where within half a page, you just point out one more time why your project is important. Try to be as convincing as possible based on the results and on the discussion why your project is um, um, is necessary to be to get a go ahead. References um, references are uh, make your project plausible and um, uh, and make your project um, uh, um, trustworthy. So it's important that you put enough effort or put sufficient effort into providing relevant references. <clears throat> Try to use scientific and um, peer-reviewed articles, preferably before um, institutional reports, and um, try to avoid websites which do not have, which are where the where results are published, which are, are not published in written documents that are somehow. And the problem with websites is just simply that they can be changed very easily, so you can have uh, uh, in one week. Um, results on a website that look differently a week later, and then it's not very um, trustworthy as a, as a source of reference. Um, okay, how are we doing? Um, so where are we coming from um, regarding sustainable development? So here about a few words to the concept of sustainable development. Um, sustainable development has usually been described um, by the comparison of a throughput economy versus, versus a spaceship economy. So um, a typical throughput economy, you just go in, you exploit the resources, you make money and you leave the waste. And in a spaceship economy, you try to reuse the wastes uh, or the environmental pollution, uh, pollution, recycle it and put it back into it, similar to this concept of a spaceship where you simply don't, cannot permit yourself to um, create waste and be wasteful with resources because resources are simply very limited. Um, this can be maybe also described with this figure here. So in a throughput economy, you go into a, a, an area, you use up the resources and you get f financial uh, benefits out of it. While in a circular economy or a recycling con uh, economy, you try to recycle the waste and reuse the resources several times before um, you, you emit it into the environment. <clears throat> um, the new term that has come up is circular economy. Circular economy not only tries to recycle it, but tries also to upcycle products uh, and to use some of the residues and create an added value of um, of the of the waste um, fluxes in in the in the in the process, a perfect example is maybe the Blue Lagoon, just outside Reykjavik city, where the Blue Lagoon was the um, geothermal was Svartsenki, the geothermal power plant was built first, and at the beginning they thought that they can just let out the um, geothermal brine into the lava field and that everything would infiltrate into the lava field turned out that the silica in the brine 
blocked the lava field and that you created this lagoon that is now there. But in a circular economy, you would look into how you can use this waste in, and to make actually, um, to use it in a, in a positive way. And this is maybe as an example, you could um, say that the Blue Lagoon did a very good job in this because they created out of this um, original unexpected um, environmental impact, they created something that has become very popular um, and um, uh, also very healthy way of using the resources for the general public by creating luxury um, um, cosmetic products mm. and by creating a spa next to it where people could use the wastewater from the geothermal power plant um, and also use the silica for, um, for a cosmetic product as an example of a circular economy. But of course, we will have, um, um, in two weeks, we will have a lecture on circular economy where um, two, two um, startup companies from Reykjavik will come and present their approach to circular economy in Reykjavik um, to get some real insight of real case studies in, in Reykjavik. <clears throat> Okay, I always show this picture of the Biosphere 2. How are we doing in time? Whoa, it's already 12. Oh, it's 11. Okay. Um, of the Biosphere 2. Um, anybody has heard of the Biosphere 2? The Biosphere 2 is a huge uh, greenhouse that was built in the um, desert of Arizona. And um, it's about 1.2 hectare large structure. And the idea was to put um, scientific experts into this greenhouse and let them live sustainable within the greenhouse by themselves. Without, without any help from the outside. The idea was that they create, that they have their own vegetation, that they grow their own food that they recycle the CO2 that they breathe out and create their own oxygen, and that they try to sustain their living in the greenhouse by themselves. Mm. Um, anyone knows why the, the system failed? Yeah, exactly, it was human dynamics. Actually, the, the scientists got into a dispute um, there was a group of scientists that looked at, it, looked at this as a scientific um, a challenge and they wanted to stick very closely um, 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 to the scientific protocol that not to include any extra, um, any, any um, resources from the outside. And there was another group that looked at it more as a sustainable, um, a sustainability exercise and that they were more interested in sustaining the system and they were not so strict on the um, uh, scientific progress of the, of the project. Mm -hmm. And this led to um, um, human conflict. And um, within a few months, the project had to be stopped because the scientists got into a dispute and they could not um, continue the project. And now it's a facility on, of, I think, the University of Arizona that is still using it to do experimental projects but the original idea of creating a greenhouse where humans were to live sustainably inside of it um, failed. And the main reason, at, the, at least at the beginning, um, was, was human dynamics. You can read this all up and there are reports about it. And the project had to be stopped um, um, after a few weeks, a um, few, um, few months. So this brings me to the concept of sustainable development. Um, it's important in order to have sustainable development, not only to look at the environment, not only to make sure that the environment is healthy and that we don't impact it, but to take also in, into account the social aspects and the economic aspects of the project. Um, if you create social tensions, like the example, um, of, of the Biosphere 2 showed, then the, the, the project is deemed because of 
if humans don't get along with each other and, uh, and, and social conflicts emerge, then you cannot sustain your project. Same is true with the economic sustainability. If people cannot sustain their livelihood and if they cannot um, make a living out of the project because simply everything is, uh, everything is protected, then the project is not sustainable neither simply because of financial issues um, it, you will not sustain the um, the production of the, the, the ongoing of the project so the point I want to make with this slide is that sustainability has three pillars um, the environmental sustainability the social sustainability and the economic economic sustainability <clears throat> In, in recent years, most authors also include, um, okay, so there's a viability um, between economic and environmental protection. There's a equi equitable, equitability between economy and social um, advancement. And there's a bearability between environmental and social um, structure. What I wanted to say before is that there's a fourth pillar, which is the cultural sustainability. Um, which has been inc become increasingly, increasingly important um, in the literature and also um, in the discussion about sustainable development is to have a cultural sustainability to preserve um, the culture um, and the tradition and the um, habits of a, of a society in, uh, in order to guarantee sustainability. Mm. Maybe an example could be at the preservation of Icelandic, you know, so that the Icelanders um, um, insist that foreigners learn Icelandic and um, in order to preserve the language um, Icelandic in, in Iceland. Because simply, um, if, if, there were, if there were not too many foreigners coming into the country and would not learn Icelandic, the, the language might get, might, might get lost. And this could be a part of cultural um, sustainability to preserve the identity and the and the cultural heritage of a of a country. Mm. A few words to the framework of sustainable water management. Um, in regard to water management, it's important to um, consider that water is in a close nexus with energy and fuel food. For example, if you want to make fresh water in in the Middle East. You need a lot of energy to produce fresh fresh water from from seawater to um, desalinate the, 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 the ocean water to create. Um, uh, so you need energy to produce fresh water. Then you can use fresh water to produce food. Um, so there's a close link between energy, water, and food. And now, recently, with climate change that is emerging more and more, uh, with the impacts of climate change emerging more and more, there's also a linkage between the climate, the water, the energy, and the food. Mm. As an example, if you look into Saudi Arabia, um, they have some water resources which are fossil, uh, freshwater resources which are in the ground, which, which are a thousand years old, and um, and and they are aware that they would be using up this fossil fresh water if they were to simply pump it out of the ground. So what they're using is they can use the energy from, um, from the petroleum that they have in order to desalinate ocean water. Um, at the same time, the warmer temperatures increase evaporation. So this, in, this, this connects the whole system to climate. And then if they were to produce fresh water, they can produce um, um, vegetables and fruits and then ship it abroad. It's one of the concerns of the Middle Eastern governments to shift away from petroleum towards um, other sectors because they are aware that maybe in the coming decades it, to make their economy more, more resilient, they need to find other sectors other than fossil, uh, fossil fuel as well. So this, this framework for sustainable water management is very much linked to energy, food production, and climate, simply because the, the four sectors are closely interlinked with each other. Mm. Um, 
So this is the example that I was mentioning before. For example, in Saudi Arabia, you have these aquifers where water that is several thousand years old is in the underground. Of course, you can use it and pump it out of the underground, but you might use it up as shown in this figure here and reach a level where it's, where it's simply too low and then you come into a situation where you're missing freshwater resources. And so what they're trying to do is to produce drinking fresh water with desalination plants. But this is of course very energy intensive and they're trying to shift towards also towards other economic sectors, for example, exporting agricultural products. But then you have to think about from a sustainability impact, does it make sense to use um, to use a lot of energy to desalinate fresh water to produce um, vegetables and uh, um, agricultural products and then to ship it towards countries where you would have more um, water availability. Um, <clears throat> but this is what I wanted to point out, the, the complex interaction of a sustainable water management in regard to the water energy and food nexus uh, uh, security nexus. Um, yeah, so maybe to just to say a few more words about the environmental and um, social and economic um, sustainability. If you want to go from a, a throughput economy towards a circular economy or towards a sustainable economy, you have to, like I mentioned before, you have to take into account these three pillars. And if you project this to Iceland, maybe um, the environment, uh, this has been also being discussed to create uh, a Vatna Jökull National Park, create a huge wilderness area in the, in the highlands. Mm. Maybe this could be considered a step towards something that is, um, that is protecting the environment in a way to preserve um, some of the natural resources. At the same time, you have to look at the economy. Um, you probably have been are aware that the Icelandic economy is, is very sensitive to external factors. Um, um, if you, um, we have seen this in 2008, there was a, um, um, the financial crisis that they impacted on the whole world had a pretty significant impact on Iceland. The country went uh, bankrupt. And of course, this had also an impact on the society mm -hmm. where um, in 2008, um, the unemployment rates rose to almost 8% in Iceland. Mm. So I wanna point this out um, in regard to Switzerland, if you compare it to Switzerland, because that's where, where I grew up, um, you can see the fluctuation of the currency, how quickly um, the Icelandic currency reacts to external um, aspects. Switzerland was also pretty heavily impacted by the financial crisis in 2008 um, because of the burst of the um, um, housing bubble in, in, in the US. But compared to Switzerland, Iceland reacted a lot more drastically. The currency lost almost 150% um, um, against the Swiss, Swiss currency. And actually over the, la over the coming years, over the last few years, the currency is still fluctuating pretty highly um, against the Swiss francs with over 20% fluctuations um, almost every year um, um, through since, since, since the last financial crisis. Um, so in 2014 was the last big increase. Um, and if you look at this, um, maybe I've seen this, maybe I've noticed this. If you would have come two years ago to Iceland in, in summer 2008, the krona you got for one Swiss France about 100 krona, and now you get almost 150. So this is an increase of 50% or a, de a devaluation of the Icelandic krona by almost 50%, which is pretty significant. Of course, there are impacts like uh, the lockdown um, and, the, uh, and the, uh, um, the bankruptcy of an airline and so on. But, but still, you see how the Icelandic economy and might be less resilient than, a, than, than a, a, um, an economy like Switzerland and um, which we could take a look into um, how to make it more sustainable um, in a way that um, such crises do not impact the currency that strong. Mm. But of course, this is a very complex topic. I'm not gonna 
go into detail, but you could at least address it within your environmental impact um, statement, um, how your project could make the economy more resilient towards external um, factors um, like described here. <clears throat> um, social um, sustainability and social resilience, um, obviously, um, if you have other sectors um, where people can uh, find a job, you can um, point out that your project has an impact on, um, on the unemployment rates and, um, uh, and try to describe within the environmental impact statement how a project can ease down um, a, an external crisis generated um, um, by, by external factors. <laughs> Um, okay, so then, yeah, this is what I mentioned before. The, um, obviously, uh, you also want to protect the nature, of course. So the creation of a national highland park, for example, could be a way forward in preserving some of the beauties and natural resources of a country by simply creating a national park um, and maybe even um, having a, entrance fees, like in the US where you have national parks where you have to pay in, to enter, um, a, a, a entry fee to enter into a national park um, could be a way forward to um, preserve some of the um, uh, natural resources of a country. Mm -hmm. um, last but not least, the um, framework for, for cultural sustainability so I put in here some of the um, cultural identities for, for Iceland, just to point this out. So you have these Icelandic dwarf houses, Haukar, um, the rotten shark, um, then you have, of course, the sagas, um, Icelandic horses, so, um, where you just try to take into account that there are some cultural aspects that you do not want to um, jeopardize through your project. Um, if you were to uh, um, if you were to build a project that might impact um, one of those factors, you might take this into account and try to find measures how to preserve or mitigate the impacts on on um, on some of the cultural heritage of a of a country. Um, is there anything more? No, no questions. Okay, um, so this brings me to this concept of resilience. Mm -hmm. I mentioned it before, and I showed it very uh, nicely with the with the resilience, the economic resilience, mm -hmm. where I compared the uh, the Swiss francs to the Icelandic krona, and I could and I showed that even though Switzerland is also impacted by a shutdown and was also impacted um, um, by by the economic crisis of 2018, it seemed that the Icelandic currency was less resilient than the than the Swiss currency. Obviously, there are various different reasons and it would be a long discussion to discuss this out. The only point I want to make that within your environmental impact statement, you want to try to describe why your project makes, makes the society more resilient towards external impacts in terms of environmental resilience, but also in terms of economic and social resilience. So the resilience is in principle just a way where, the, where, where you have an external impact, but your society can recover from, from this, from this um, impact without major losses. So for example, if you would have um, a, an economic crisis that hits a society where the pension funds are heavily depending on, on, on investments into those economic sectors that are not resilient, then you would have a huge impact and parts of the pension funds might get lost. Um, so these pension funds are very, very vulnerable towards economic um, impacts from the outside. Mm -hmm. So if you can create a project that can increase the resilience, this would be of course something that you could include in your environmental impact assessment statement. Okay, so here's more or less a, um, 
a, a summary of how to go from vulnerability to resilience by uh, taking um, hazards and stresses into account by having a governance that um, takes um, um, that takes resilience into account and tries to promote um, um, projects and incentives that make the society more resilient um, by strengthening the livelihood and diversity of a country and um, by looking into future uncertainty. So the, the concept of resilience is quite complex and of course case specific. So you would have to look into various different aspects, how your project can um, enhance some of those points that are listed in this, in this figure by strengthening the community or decentralizing and participatory decisions and so on to make a society um, more resilient. If you're more interested in this, uh, feel free to um, 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 read, this, read this article that I, I put the link here and because there's a bit more described how you can go from a vulnerable society towards something that is more resilient. I wanna spend a few more words on the environmental resilience um, just to explain how the environment can also be vulnerable towards economic impact, towards outside impacts. Of course, it's with less the economic impact, but it can be natural impacts. For example, here you have Mount Hecla. Mount Hecla is the Iceland's most active volcano. On average, it erupts every 50 years. So it's, um, if you, if you uh, look up the environmental of uh, the um, Metrological Office of Iceland, they are always giving out the status that Mount Hecla, uh, the pressure in Mount Hecla is increasing and that there might be an eruption coming very soon. But the point I want to make, the original Icelandic birch forest was resilient towards volcanic eruption because the original for, um, birch forest as seen in this picture, they had a root system that reached deep into the soil and could reach deeper than a, than a, than a, than a layer of, of ash from a, from a volcanic eruptions as seen very nicely in this picture. Mm. You can see in this picture that the roots of the trees go deep into the soil, several meters deep, and that even if the whole area is covered with a half a meter of, of ash, this, the, 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 the trees would still be able to catch uh, water from the underground and, and, and grow leaves on the, on the, on the, on the leaves. And um, when, the ice, when a thousand years, when the settlers came, the first settlers came and they cut down the birch trees, um, because at the beginning, a thousand years ago, 40% of Iceland was a forest and um, was covered by, um, by birch forests, similar as in this picture. Um, about a thousand years later, in 1944, um, southern Iceland looked like this, simply because the trees have been cut down and then the wind, the harsh wind, the long winters and the frequent volcanic eruptions with the sand erosion and created almost an area that looked like a desert. Mm. This area looks today like this. This is the same farmstead. I showed this picture also yesterday. But the point I want to make is that here, the National Agency, Soil Conservation Service of Iceland, um, has actually done a, 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 a really successful restoration effort by rebuilding up the vegetation and making the vegetation resilient again towards the harsh climatic conditions that are in, in Iceland and also partially towards this continuous drifting of ash and sand across the country. At least part of the area has been restored. And this is what you would call um, ecological resilience because there the vegetation can sustain the impacts from harsh winters and from volcanic eruptions and sand drift um, by itself again. Um, okay, someone is again waiting in the waiting room. I have to quickly see how I can. Oh. Okay, so this 
this was what I wanted to say about um, ecological resilience. Um, the same I wanted to show with this figure by comparing the Swiss francs against the Icelandic krona um, regarding economic resilience. And then, um, uh, um, like I showed before, and then of course the same can be said also for social resilience. Maybe if you have a society where people, um, um, yeah, I, I would like to ask it as a question, how you define social resilience? Because of, obviously it's a question of the opinion and um, different people have different opinions. Some people would argue that you have a society that is more resilient towards changes if you have um, a strong social support in the system. So if someone get, um, becomes jobless, that, it, that this person would be supported by, the, by um, a social security. Other people would argue that uh, maybe the societies are more resilient towards changes if, if everybody looks for themselves. So I'm not, I, I can't give you an answer because of obviously it's also a question of opinion, but I just wanna put it out there. And in your report, um, you, can, you can include maybe a statement also how your project is gonna increase the resilience of the society and, and create a society that holds together in, in a stronger way um, than before your project was built. Mm. Um, for example, this could be because um, through your project, you can, um, you can create um, um, some incentives that people work more together um, and uh, create a stronger community. But this is really a bit up to you and because it's also, also a bit a question of opinion, how you define the social resilience. Um, yeah, so this is up to now. What I would like you to reflect on is how your project um, is gonna impact on the resilience of environmental resilience, social resilience, but also economic resilience um, um, within. So we come, we have finished the first part of this morning lecture and we have a short quiz and then we will make a break of 10 minutes. So Yang Shu, if you can hear us, maybe we can start with the quiz, the first quiz number one. So again, just like yesterday, um, please take your cell phone or take a new web browser. Um, go to um, menti.com. And then type in the code 140069. So we have 21 participants. Um, maybe we can reach still a, a few more. And then we're gonna have um, a short quiz that Yang Shu prepared for us um, about this first part of the lecture. If anyone would still like to join, we have 27 participants. Okay, um, I think we're just going to start. If anyone still would like to join, you can join later. So first question, Iceland is not a member of which European organization, European Economic Area, European Union, European Free Trade Association, all of them. So remember, not a member. Time's up. Exactly, Iceland is not a member of the European Union. It is a member of the European Economic Area and it is a member of EFTA, which is the um, um, a tra um, trade treaty where Switzerland is included as well. Switzerland is not part of the EEA, economic, European Economic Area. Lorenzo was fastest um, with 967 points. And then we can go on with the next question. Question two. Uh, what is the main document submitted during an 
environmental impact assessment process. Is it the environmental impact assessment report, the environmental impact report, environmental impact statement, none of them. Yeah, it's actually the environmental impact statement, but it's true. So this is a question um, um, where, which depends on the legislation. Sometimes the wording is different, but at least in the European Union, it's usually the environmental impact statement that includes all that, that, it, that it includes all the environmental impacts. It's, it's the main report that you hand in during an environmental impact assessment process. But in most countries you have to hand in first an environmental um, sc um, screening um, document and then an environmental impact um, a scoping document and then you hand in the, the, the big um, document which is the environmental impact statement. So we have um, Tweedo was fastest um, with 1,896 points. Um, followed by Thorstein and then Lorenzo in third place and Chloe following up in fourth place. Okay, we, maybe go to the next question. Question three. What does the concern of the term spaceship Earth usually refer to? Human overpopulation, limited resources available on Earth, the ecosystem will be destroyed by an asteroid. None of them. Okay, four seconds left. And so we have a new leader. Um, limited resources available on Earth. Yes, exactly. Um, it's simply that we have to reuse the resources or and create a more um, sustain, sustainable way. Use it in a more sustainable way. And um, I think Lorenzo is still in the lead, followed by Thorstein, and then Loco is coming up from behind um, with a um, nice teddy bear. And so as an icon, so a very tight race here only a few points separating everyone. So again, the faster you vote, the more points you get also. Uh, question four of seven. Um, which kind of economy focuses on upcycling? Throughput economy, recycling economy, circular economy, none of them. Uh, I think we, we had one slide on this um, where we looked at the throughput economy, the recycling economy, and the circular economy. Um, and, um, and of course, upcycling means that you make more out of the waste than the original um, product. For example, we discussed the, green, the, the Blue Lagoon as, a, as an example of up, upcycling. Um, and of course, the circular economy is the economy where you actually use the waste the leftovers and you create something that has sometimes even a higher economic value than the or original product. Um, so Lorenzo is in the lead followed by Loco um, with um, almost 50 points, um, 62 points uh, lead for Lorenzo followed closely by local. Okay, two more questions. Uh, question five. Uh, what is the answer? Which of the following is included in the sustainable developments interconnected domains? Ecology, economy, society, culture, all of them. Yeah, these are the different domains we discussed in the slides several times. We also discussed it in regards of resilience. Um, so what is needed to have a sustainable development? Um, so let's see who got this right. And it is, of course, it's all of them. 
uh, because you, it, you cannot be sustainable if the environment is not taken care of, if, if this, this economy is not um, sustainable, then it, then it will not work. And of course, it needs also to be sustainable in a social way. So that's why it's important that you have four pillars that are taken, considered all together, including, of course, this cultural sustainability, um, because you also want to preserve the national identity of of the of the region. Mm -hmm. Lorenzo was still fastest again taking the lead um, expanding his advance over local local one and uh, we have two more questions question number six so what is the question number six the question is why is the water energy food nexus so important for sustainable water management Food is the most important product. Energy is the most important product. Water is the most important product. Water, energy, and food are interconnected. Yeah, I talked about this with the example from Saudi Arabia, where you um, have where you need energy to produce um, fresh water, and then you can produce with fresh water food. Um, so there's a, uh, of course, it's the interconnection of the different sectors. There, um, if you produce energy, you need water, and vice versa. To produce fresh water, you also need energy, and so on. And I think Lorenzo was again, is still first, but he was not fastest. Schnudel was fastest. Oh, uh, um, with a, um, uh, and Lorenzo took the lead. So there's one more question. Loco one and Loco four are competing for second place. Um, and this is the last question. So if you answer fast, you get more points. Which of the following is, is or the aims of cultural sustainability? Maintaining cultural beliefs, maintaining cultural practices, maintaining heritage conservation, all of them. Okay, um, 10 more seconds. Um, okay, five more seconds. Uh, can I see if Lorenzo preserves the first place? And so most of you got this correctly. And who is going to be the winner? And local one, uh, Lorenzo seems to take the lead. I think he preserves the lead. Yes. Okay. Congratulations to Lorenzo. Lorenzo won with 6,633 points. Of course, cultural and and sustainability, it's important to preserve um, uh, the cultural heritage, the, the, the habits, the traditions, um, and, um, the, and everything that involves culture. So we're going to make a short break. Let's be back um, in 10 minutes at 12.10. And then we start with, this, uh, um, with the second part of the lecture. 10 minutes break, and then we're, we're back. See you soon. Okay, we'll, we'll continue with the second part of the lecture. <clears throat> um, the project the process and the, and the product. So we'll try to um, speed a bit up because we have um, about um, well, one hour, 45 minutes. Um, but well, maybe it should be yeah, better in time. Mm -hmm. um, was there a comment? Yes, there was a comment. Okay, so there was a question. Um, how are we constrained regarding the topic of the environmental impact assessment? Can it be already operational company or do we have to design a new company that operates within the same field? <clears throat> so obviously um, what we're trying to do within this course is to mimic an environmental impact assessment process. Um, it will not be possible to uh, go into um, a full environmental impact assessment process because as you've seen, usually the, those processes take several years. So if you take a complex project for example, I'm thinking of the, 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 the Arctic drilling prod idea to look into the Arctic drilling. This is a pretty a complex project that involves a lot of information, a lot of uncertainty, 
uh, maybe even simulations and, and, and other aspects. So there you can limit yourself and say, look, we're only going to write an environmental impact statement about a specific area of the project. The same can be done with a, with a company that is operational, for example. Um, you can limit yourself as long as in the system boundary, you clearly define that your environmental impact statement involves only a certain aspect, uh, that's fine with me. Um, what I'm, the purpose of this course is to mimic the entire environmental impact assessment process and by mimicking it, so you will actually in a way present on Friday your idea and you can get feedback from your classmates. Hopefully your classmates will give you feedback about concerns um, and maybe um, um, some issues that you should like look more into detail. So in a way, the first presentation of Friday is in a way a presentation of the scoping, um, 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 scoping document that you hand in or that you publish for the general public to review. <clears throat> you can then present two weeks later the final in environmental impact statement and also during the final presentations you will also get feedback where you again get some concerns so typically maybe some concerns are that you don't include up, um, the construction of a plant or the decommissioning of a plant but within it, it's not possible to go into detail um, about everything what I do will take into account is how far you go into detail. If you're going to write about only the operational phase, I would expect you to go a bit more in depth about the operational phase than if you were to write about the whole project. So for example, if you were to think about the wind farm and you were to look only at the operational phase is fine with me, but then I would expect you to go a bit more into detail about um, maybe visual aspects, about um, impacts on bird life, um, because since you're excluding some of the uh, um, 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 impacts during, the, during the, the extraction of the resources, um, I would expect you to go more into detail of, of, um, um, of, of, the, of the topic that you're focusing on. There's another question, which is, um, can we contact a real life company and use their figure on metrics? Um, yes, I would actually find this very interesting if you were to look into a real life uh, project. Um, um, there were, like I said before, um, um, Landsverken um, submitted an environmental impact statement for Burfettel, a wind farm or also Hwamerswerken, a um, uh, hydropower plant in southern Iceland. We discussed this in previous years. You can, um, you can take a look at their environmental impact statement. <clears throat> um, this is fine with me. Um, what I, of course, I will not accept if you simply copy paste a report that is out there or if you simply translate a, re a report in Iceland, Icelandic into English. Um, I really would like you to go through the process of collecting information. Um, maybe ex if you're looking to a, 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 um, a real life company, for example, Landsverken that is trying to build a hydropower plant or a, or a wind farm somewhere, um, um, you can take their environmental impact statements that are online uh, and maybe um, address the concerns that have been put out um, by the by the planning agency. Uh, for example, Hwamerswerken uh, in, in Trossau, River Trossau was rejected by the planning agency and you could find their report and then try to come up with a report that addresses their specific um, um, requests. And you will see that this goes pretty much into detail where you would have to maybe focus on a very specific aspect of the environmental impact statement. But this is fine with me, as long as you um, submit something that follows the environmental impact assessment process. Um, um, and as long as you 
um, address the concepts of um, environmental impact assessment is fine with me. Any other further questions? Okay, I'm gonna try to go over the next um, um, slide. So this is really about a div, um, different um, example of projects. <clears throat> so you have here six pictures of possible projects where environmental impact assessments have been written. For example, the uh, King's Cross Urban Redevelopment Area, um, which was a train station in central London, where the inner city has been, uh, an entire district of a city has been redeveloped and um, um, renewed in a way so that, it be, that the livelihood could be increased. So there, this is an example where an environmental impact statement was written. Olympic stadiums, um, for example, here in London, um, in the, for the 2012 uh, Olympics in London, this was a, another example where an environmental impact sta statement was written. Uh, stadiums typically include number of parking lots, number of stores that are included, um, public transport to reduce the, 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 the private parking, uh, private cars coming to the stadium are included in, 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 in environmental impact statements. And of course, the entire construction phase and also the use after the um, Olympics how, the, how it's going to be used afterwards um, should be included in, in such environmental impact statements. <clears throat> the third picture, a nuclear power plant. Nuclear power plants are extremely complex. Um, I, will, I, would rec I would avoid a project like this to do it within three weeks. Simply it's too complex to, um, um, to assess it in a, a, a um, coherent and a concise way. So I would avoid a, a complex project like um, a nuclear power plant, for example. Um, a bridge between Sweden and Denmark um, can be a very interesting environmental impact statement. How much, what are the environmental impacts during the construction? Um, how will it decrease or increase traffic on both sides during the operation? And um, how, can it, well, how can it be dealt with afterwards and what are the um, economic impacts and what are the social implications um, of such a project. <clears throat> um, Danish, uh, an offshore wind farm has been also addressed uh, frequently in a previous project. And then again, a nuclear power plant. Um, uh, um, of course, a nuclear power plant always needs an environmental impact assessment, <clears throat> but it's probably too big for, for um, like a project work within three weeks. Other examples um, um, are Olympic Games, um, which frequently also undergo an environmental impact assessment nowadays because the, it's, it's becoming more and more important to um, create Olympic Games that are um, more sustainable. And um, here, that, that could be interesting where you could, well, in this case, um, um, the selection of the two 2026 um, Olympic Games where you have six different or five different candidates. Um, I think two already or three already withdrew. Um, currently it's only Milano, uh, Cortina and Stockholm that are in the race for um, submitting their application for the 2026 um, Olympic Games and their environmental impact statements could have a very positive effect on the applications. If you can show that your um, application is, has a lesser, uh, lower environmental impact, that could be a, um, a positive point in the application. <clears throat> um, yeah, for example, if you have um, um, Olympic Games, then of course the travel between the different um, sites of um, uh, of competitions is important. Um, if you, for example, for the case of Milano, you have um, 400 kilometers. Um, and in the case of Stockholm, you have even 7,000. Uh, I don't see it exactly, I think it's 500 kilometers. Uh, or 616 kilometers. Um, but yeah, of course, this, is, um, this, this creates a, a, an, an impact due to uh, private traffic when the locations 
for the different events during the Olympic Games are distributed in a wide area um, when the Alpine skiing events are far away from the from the from the main um, city where the play, the games take place that could be a um, um, part of an environmental impact uh, statement how people are going to travel between the different locations <clears throat> example of products um, electric cars uh, is a big issue that has always been um, um, raised uh, interest again because of course for the for the production of the lithium extraction of the lithium which might be produced in South America uh, which has a very high water footprint to the construction of the car then the use of the car um, and then also the decommissioning of the batteries and uh, and the remaining parts of the car how to recycle parts of the car um, can be interesting um, parts of environmental impact statement a group of students looked one looked once at Icelandic tomato production and compared it to uh, tomatoes that are imported from Spain and looked at the carbon footprint um, and they found out that I think if you um, eat, um, well, I think it was 70 kilograms of tomatoes that you have to eat um, throughout the year in order to um, compensate the carbon footprint of one flight towards Europe um, um, by simply eating local Icelandic tomatoes instead of imported tomatoes from outside. This is, was a typical life cycle analysis that the students did um, uh, and addressed it in an environmental impact statement regarding um, Icelandic tomato production. <clears throat> Fairphone was another interesting project that a group of students looked into. Um, Fairphone is this uh, a cell phone that is produced in a very sustainable way where the resources are extracted in a very sustainable way. Um, a group of students looked into that as well. Uh, wind turbines, wind farm um, has been addressed by several projects already. Um, and um, it's of course also an interesting and very relevant topic for Iceland <clears throat> um, with the construction of a um, wind park in the highlands of Iceland. And then uh, different uh, solar cells, um, uh, how to make them more efficient and um, use resources that are less, less um, um, or that, that are more abundant um, could be another topic of, of an environmental impact statement. <clears throat> um, so there are two different types of life cycle for products and processes. Typically for um, a product, you have to in um, yeah, for a product, typically you have the initiation of the idea, the concept, the planning, the right required analysis, the design, the development, the integration of the test, the implementation, the operation and the maintenance and the disposition of the product. So it goes through the various different phases of the product, how it is being developed, how it is being used and how it is being decommissioned. Um, and you can describe the system boundary. Um, I'm going to come back to the system boundary in a later, later, later slate. But if you take, for example, the life cycle of a product of one liter of milk from Iceland, you could consider the fertilizer that is being produced somewhere abroad, the soya, soya beans for the, for the food production for the, for the cows that are being shipped towards the dairy factory, and the oil recovery and refining that is used in order to run the factory. Then you have the cows that are actually producing, um, that are eating the food and the, um, using the fertilizer by grazing on the grass. And then they produce milk and this milk is being shipped to the dairy plant and then to the supermarket and then the consumer. So here at a complete life cycle would include every, everything from the soya bean production to the fertilizer production all the way to the consumer. But then through the system boundary, you can um, say that you're going to focus only on the operation of the di um, dairy farm in Iceland, for example. Um, so you 
So you exclude some of the um, aspects of the life cycle of the life cycle product. <clears throat> same, same can be done for biodiesel, for example. Biodiesel, um, um, you use um, a biomass to produce um, um, biodiesel, um, and then you have the um, uh, renewable fuel, and then you drive your car where the CO two is recycled. So while you drive your car, you have a very clean. Um, um, or almost carbon neutral carbon balance. But then of course, if you consider the production of the uh, biomass um, and the crop refining, you might have some additional um, impacts that you might take into account. Third example, aluminum. Um, here also, again, similar to the milk example, you can either um, take into account the proxic epoxide uh, extraction, the aluminum refining, the primary primary smelting, and then that this this is what's done in Iceland: the, the processing and the smelting of the uh, or, or the, uh, the smelting of the aluminium is done in Iceland. And then you can also look into how the aluminium is then processed afterwards in, in more detail. So the main point I want to make here that this life cycle, um, um, this life cycle of a product. Um, here you really can go from the very beginning to the very end of the consumption, uh, from the extraction of the resources to the consumption and take, include everything or within your project, um, if the project is too big, as for the example of those three examples, maybe focus on one specific phase of the life cycle within your environmental impact um, statement. Mm. A, pro a project has a slightly different life cycle because um, um, a project, for example, if you think um, of Olympic Games, then you would have um, um, you would have to um, look at the impacts before the decision, after the decision, and then um, also after the decommissioning after the Olympic Games, go through all the processes and describe. Um, how the environmental impacts change for a project or throughout the project, um, um, uh, throughout the different phases of a project. <clears throat> um, so we had actually this, this slide should go one slide up. Um, it's more, it belongs to the product, to the life cycle of a product. So maybe this slide kind of slipped, slipped through there. But what I want to, um, um, especially in regard to the life cycle, life cycle project, the time scale is quite important. So if you take into account, for example, a nuclear power plant, um, you have the planning that takes several years, um, up to 10 years or even more. Then you might have another 10 years of potential conflict resolution until you can build it. Then you have the construction, which takes again maybe five years, and then you have an operation of maybe thirty years of the of the nuclear power plant, and then a close down and decommissioning of a nuclear power plant. Um, afforestation scheme um, might have a similar time range, but the potential of conflict and planning is 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 a lot shorter. Maybe it's going to take two two years of planning, two years of um, solving conflicts and conflicts of interest, and then um, have a, construct, a construction while during, during two years, and then the afforestation scheme runs for uh, maybe 70, 80 years by, by um, and, and the close down will be a rather small part because you're building up a forest and it's not a big issue, not such a big issue. A holiday village, has a lot shorter planning period. Maybe also conflicts are a lot smaller, and then, but maybe the operation phase um, is also a bit smaller, um, um, and probably an even shorter um, lifetime might be a gravel extraction. So you can describe your project with um, a figure like this, where you just describe the different um, phases of your project. Um, to kind of categorize the impacts within your environmental impact statement um, in your report. Mm. Um, 
So um, another way of structuring your environmental impact statement is by looking at the physical environment, the social economic environment, and the temporal uh, evolution of the environment. So this goes into these, into these environmental dimensions. You have seen it before that before I kind of showed the, the different phases of a project, um, which is one dimension, but you also have the dimension of social economic environment and physical environment. You can classify this a bit like this, that you have on the one side, you have the time of your project, then you have the space, the physical space that it is needed for your spa, uh, project, and then you have the different spheres. So again, this is a way of structuring your report. You don't need to do it this way, but it's a way to help you um, um, maybe structure the report. So the different spheres um, are, you have, for example, the water, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, the lithosphere, and the biosphere, where you can address the impacts on the different spheres. Obviously, if you have a, um, if you have, for example, a, a, a Arctic drilling project, you might impact on the water quality in the Arctic Sea, and this would then concern the hydrosphere. You might have a mission that go into the atmosphere. This would impact on the atmosphere, and you might have um, pollutants that go into the ground, which would impact on the lithosphere. And then you might have the animal world that is impacted by your project, um, which impacts on the biosphere. So this is meant by this environmental dimension regarding the different spheres that can be impacted by your project. And then you have the space. So you might go from a very um, small scale impact on the autonomy of the cell. Um, if you have something cancerogenic, this might impact directly on the cell structure, on the DNA um, and reproduction of cells on a very small scale. Um, at the bigger scale, um, you might destroy some of the habitats of some um, um, species, like for example, for these uh, little mammals or the, or the blue whale might be impacted by, um, by the by, by a construction site in, in the, of a, of a um, drilling site in the Arctic. And then you come to whole communities, which might be impacted. Um, for example, a, a small town might be intact, impacted by tourism, of course, maybe in a positive way also. So here you go into um, um, already a dimension, a physical dimension that involves entire municipalities or um, in the case of Tokyo, an entire metropolitan area, or in the case of the Yosemite National Park, an entire national park of a, of a country. And then of course you go into the, uh, uh, you can also go into a um, geopolitical and global scale where you can say that um, a certain project can have an impact on an entire continent or also on the, uh, on the entire world. Um, so this is really just to give you um, an idea how your impact, how your um, project can be structured in terms of um, the different environmental dimensions. Of time, like I mentioned before, is an important frame. Um, uh, you have here different examples of how long something takes. Um, uh, for example, in the case of uh, radioactive decay, of uh, radioactive waste from a nuclear power plant, which is typically cesium-137, which has a half time of about 30 years, then you might consider that in case of an accident or in case or um, by decommissioning the, the, the plant, um, you might have a half time of radioactivity of 30 years and um, accordingly, it might take a long time until um, a a contaminated area um, becomes accessible again. Mm. Um, yeah, so just here another another figure from from a, from a, another publication, how they scaled the time scale and the spatial scale of a project um, um, regarding um, different um, physical skills and temporal skills on the 
um, cumulative human impact of, of activities. Ideally, your entire environment, environmental impact statement um, would focus on a sustainable development focused assessment tools. So typically, um, you would have a holistic, comprehensive, integrated and strategic environmental impact statement, which includes various different um, methods. For example, a life cycle analysis could be done, um, which is very comprehensive. Um, also partly integrated because it includes all phases, but it does not yet have a strategic component in it, um, nor does it have any social um, components in it. So an LCA really focuses, covers the entire environmental impact, but does not yet cover the complete strategic um, and integrated assessment. <clears throat> the point I wanna make that in order to have a complete holistic environmental impact statement, you might want to use various different methods like life cycle analysis, cost benefit analysis, envir environmental auditing, multi-criteria assessment and risk assessment in order to come up with something that covers the strategy, the compre 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 comprehensiveness and the integrated integrativeness in order to come up with something that is completely completely holistic. Mm. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is more or less what is kind of expected, obviously within the three weeks, you're not expected to come up with a complete holistic environmental impact statement, but maybe part of such a st um, statement where you look into, for example, the life cycle analysis of a project and you look at the specific topic of your project. Um, um, for example, the carbon footprint of a project or uh, the operation of a, um, um, a, a certain instrument or, or, or a factory. Um, um, so yeah, so that, that is kind of what I would like you to show within your environmental impact project. I'm gonna go straight on because we're a little bit behind schedule. Um, and so how to proceed? The first step you already, hopefully already started, create a team. Your team should be um, composed of experts from different disciplines because like you've been discussing, um, you will touch upon various different um, um, disciplines within your report. So if you have a team that is composed of experts from with the different backgrounds, you might have an advantage in, writing, in um, providing a um, holistic um, approach to your environmental impact statement. Screening, um, I put here this example of de-icing. You know, on the left-hand side, you have Reykjavik. On the right-hand side, you have um, um, the city of Geneva. Geneva is located on a freshwater lake, the Lake of Geneva. And the point I wanna make is that in Iceland, of course, if you put out salt onto the streets and you um, start de-icing the roads, it's not a big issue because the water, um, the salt flows directly into the ocean and gets diluted back, in, uh, back into something that is anyway um, salty. While in Geneva, if you put out a lot of salt, this goes into the ocean, it goes into the freshwater lake and then increases the salinity and this can have um, an impact on the environment of the, of the lake and, the, and, and therefore it is a more critical issue in Geneva to put out salt on the streets than it is in Reykjavik. Mm. You have here the report that over 50% of the salinity in the lake increases mostly due to the de-icing of roads and um, that is meant by screening a bit. As an example, um, I use this um, de-icing with salt because in one case, it's completely irrelevant because the salt flows straight into the ocean back into it again and, um, uh, and dissolves in the ocean, which is anyway salt water. While on the other hand, you have a freshwater system where the biology and the, and the aquatic life 
might be very um, jeopardized by incoming salt water into the freshwater um, system. Um, point, um, yeah, so this is the, the kind of screening I would like to see when you um, look into the different aspects of your project um, and screen if you see a relevance or not. So in real life, this is frequently done with thresholds. So you simply have um, um, thresholds that have to be taken into account if an environmental impact assessment is needed. Um, so the advantages of thresholds is that it's um, simple, quick, and consistent. But on the other hand, the disadvantages is, is that it's inflexible, arbitrary, no room for common sense, difficult to change, while case-by-case case, uh, um, um, decisions have the advantage that you can use common sense, it's more flexible. The disadvantage is that it's ambiguous, slow and costly. There might be abuse and uh, um, there might be poor judgment of decision makers. Mm. So if you relate this to the previous slide where you have the um, uh, de-icing with salt, then you can see that the threshold for the example of Reykjavik and uh, um, Geneva would, would not make much sense. Because if you say, okay, you're only allowed to put out this amount of salt, um, in Geneva, this might have a big impact and in, in Reykjavik, it would just flow back into the ocean. So it might have almost no impact. So um, a threshold would, for that specific case, not really um, make much sense. Um, so, th so yeah. Um, next point I would like you to look into is the functional unit. The functional unit is really the unit where you describe how much impacts are created for one operational output. Um, I put here this example of the Blue Lagoon within the background, you have the Swartzenki um, um, geothermal power plant. And at the beginning, the geothermal power plant, at first the geothermal power plant was built to produce 100 megawatt electricity. And um, so Swartzenki was built with 100 or 75 megawatt electricity, electricity and 150 megawatt thermal energy for the for district heating uh, for the surrounding municipalities and um, and later on the blue lagoon was created with over, with almost 700,000 visitors in 2014 they produce cosmetic products you also have carbon recycling that produces methanol and ethanol um, um, just close by and so the question is how do you define a functional unit for this system where you have various different outputs and how do you allocate afterwards the, um, the, um, um, the, the environmental impacts to what product. So this is why the functional unit is important because here you could say per megawatt electricity, this amount of pollutants are created or this, this is the impact that is created but then you don't take into account that there are actually other benefit, um, beneficial products created from the, from the product. And this has to be discussed within the definition of the functional unit. Mm. Maybe to simplify this, you can take the very simple case of an electric light bulb. Um, you can have a, a, in a, in a, in a, a, a traditional light bulb conventional light bulb like it existed um, 30, 40 years ago, which simply has a little wire that is heated up that starts to glow, which emits a lot of um, 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 thermal energy as well. Then you can have a lamp with a halogen gas inside where the gas is activated and starts to glow. Or you can have what is now usually sold, a LED lamp, which is of course more, much more efficient. And if you were to define the functional unit of such a light bulb, you would say that it's the amount of light that is produced, a physical unit would be lumen. Um, and then you would say that the amount of light, because that is the product that comes out of the light bulb, um, um, is the physical, is the functional unit for this light bulb. So um, if you, and then the two, 
the three products become comparable. For example, a conventional light bulb use, uh, produces 12 to 18 lumens per watt. A halogen lamp produces 16 to 24 lumens per watt. And a LED lamp can produce up to 90 lumens per watt. And uh, you can see already that a LED lamp can be uh, almost 10 times more efficient than a, a conventional light bulb with an electric wire. Mm. So then you can also have a light sensor and you can actually adapt the uh, functional unit to the lumens arriving to the actual person who would like to see the steps. So here, for example, if you had a, um, a LED lamp in here with a sensor, the sensor would turn off as soon as there's enough sunlight. And so then you could have a functional unit that actually looks at only the product that is really being used to, um, to um, uh, by the end user. While here the lamp is burning without being used, so you could increase the, um, the meaning of the functional unit by uh, defining the functional unit in a way that it is only you, um, considering the product that is also used by the end user. And in this case, it's the person walking up the stairs who would like to see the stairs. And during daytime, there's no need to have a, a light um, um, shining onto the stairs because there's enough sunlight. Mm. So if you compare this, you can have these uh, traditional uh, um, light bulbs uh, that um, uh, and you, you can compare the energy consumption. Um, of course, you also, also take into account how long, what is the lifetime of such a light bulb to, to take the, the temporal um, environmental dimensions into account. And then you can see um, that LED lamps are even more efficient than um, halogen, um, conventional light band bulbs, halogen light bulbs, or, or um, um, previous light bulbs. And if you include a little sensor and you consider only the energy consumption used for the actual used um, illumination of the stairs, then you could reduce the or increase the efficiency of an LED lamp with a sensor even um, more by simply turning it off during the um, during daytime. So there's a question um, regarding if you can contact real life companies um, to do your project. Um, I just see it now, I'm sorry, I didn't see this before, but um, the answer is yes. I think um, if the companies agree to provide you information, that would be of course great. We can then discuss it in class and we, we have a project that is more realistic. So um, from my side, I would even encourage you to contact companies um, so that we can have a more realistic discussion about your project. Uh, if you integrate information and um, data of a real life uh, company. Um, okay, so this slide is about the quality of the functional unit. Um, that has been uh, in regard to the newer light bulbs has frequently discussed that the newer light bulbs don't create the same light quality as previous light bulbs because the, the especially the halogen lamps, they have been considered as being a bit cold light, and, uh, which is not as comfortable um, uh, um, to read or to or to sit in. So, um, but this has also been um, um, researched furthermore. And the LED lamps nowadays, you can adjust the 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 wavelength of the lamps so that you can have a wavelength that corresponds to your personal preferences. But functional unit sometimes there's also the component of quality. It has to be taken into account with when, you, when you compare, for example, um, organic products with um, um, conventionally produced products, um, you might consider that organic products also have um, higher um, quality um, uh, um, or just, yeah, than conventionally produced products. 
So this is a uh, little exercise for you to um, do by yourself. So if you think about the grocery store, uh, if you go gro uh, do grocery and you have a plastic bag, a paper pack and a cotton cloth grocery sack, what is the functional unit of such a bag? Um, I'm gonna just skip, uh, go quickly through this. The functional unit would be the transport of a well-defined grocery from a to B, from the store to your home. And then of course you have to consider that usually a plastic bag is um, only can contain half of a paper bag because a paper bag is a little bit bigger. And maybe a paper bag, you can use it twice if you bring it with you, while a cloth bag uh, can be used um, uh, a thousand times. And of course you can reuse it again. So, um, so this, flows into the functional unit of a grocery bag that is being used, uh, being used by, um, that you can use. Mm. The environmental baseline, I touched upon this also before. Um, before you start your project, you want to describe the baseline of your project. What happen, uh, what are the environmental impacts before you start your project? How does it look like before? I have two examples here. One project I worked in myself, and so this was a um, hydropower plant that was constructed upstream of a river. And you can see here the fishing yields that increased in the 1930s, and then it decreased from the 1970s up until the year 2000s, and um, um, the fishing yields decreased again. And in this particular case, it was very useful to describe the baseline because there was an overlaying um, secondary impact that led to an increase on fishing yields um, due to um, untreated sewage that was released into the water. At the same time, in the 1960s, hydropower plants were built upstream of the river. And at first, people argued that the, that the hydropower plants are responsible for declining fishing yields. But what we could show with uh, numerical models is that the sewage and untreated uh, nutrients that are being that are flown into that are being spilled into the river simply increase the the availability of nutrients for the fish. This increased the fishing yields, so it was not an effect of the hydropower plant that led to the decreasing fishing yields in this river. Um, same, a similar thing is happening in uh, Great Britain um, where a geothermal um, um, power plant is being installed and they are monitoring the baseline um, before they start to do the drilling in order to find out what is the quality of the groundwater and what is the uh, seismicity and the atmospheric composition assessment in the area in order to um, know what is the environmental impact before a project and then compare it to the impacts um, during, the, during the operation of the pro uh, project and maybe even after the project. So um, yeah, then the next thing defining the system boundary, am I already um, touched upon this before with the example of the cheese? So system boundary is really important because there you define what is included in your project and what is excluded from your project. So for example, of cheese production, you can include the crops production, the milk production, the transportation to the dairy plant, the processing of the cheese and the packaging. And then you might want to exclude the transport to the store and the, and the, the people driving to the store with the car and bringing it home and the disposal of the, of the um, packaging in at home. But it's important that you define the system boundary because then you make it clear what is considered within your project and what is not considered or what is excluded from the project. Right. Here another, another example for a query where you have energy, water and raw materials that go into it and you have outputs um, um, of polluted waters, airport emissions, solid wastes, and so on. But in this particular case, they drew a system boundary around 
the operational phase and they excluded uh, where the energy is coming from, where the water is coming from, and where the raw materials are coming from. So this is, so the system boundary is really where you define what is included in your assessment and what not. <clears throat> it's especially um, interesting when you look at nuclear power plants because there is always controversially discussed what is included in a um, um, system boundary of an environmental impact assessment of a nuclear power plant. Obviously, if you just consider the operation of a nuclear power plant, there are almost no CO2 emissions because it's mostly um, water vapor that comes out of it, especially if you, if you use like here, Mühleberg in Switzerland, the, 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 the heat energy for district heating, then, um, then you can have a very um, low carbon footprint to, um, to, for, for nuclear power. If you consider the um, extraction of uranium, as here in Australia, as an example from Australia, where some of the uranium comes from for, for, to, as the fuel for the, for the nuclear power plants, then you have to consider, of course, all the trucks that have to drive down there, all the energy needed to dig down into the hole and to extract the uranium. And you also have to consider that with the depletion of the most accessible uranium, the energy requirements to extract the remaining or, uh, uranium becomes more higher and higher. And this might be associated with a slightly higher um, carbon footprint. And if you make them the entire um, life cycle uh, on carbon footprint of a nuclear power plant, you might come up with a, slight, um, a different carbon footprint of the um, energy production. So the point I want to make, it's important that you define your system boundary because only then um, the reader can understand what you're writing about. Um, um, and, and keep in mind that you're writing your environmental impact statement for those who are most critical about your project. Because those people who are in favor of your project, um, they already want, they're already convinced that your project is a good project. So you want to convince those which are skeptical and critical about your project that your project is good. So you have to be transparent, otherwise you, um, um, yeah, um, you want to be as convincing as possible for those who are skeptical about your project, that your project is a sustainable um, and um, um, project that should be supported by the public and the, and the local communities. So um, another important aspect in regard to system boundary and in regard to um, a life cycle analysis is the allocation of CO2. Uh, you can see here the picture of um, uh, Hedley's Haiti, I think it's, I think it's Neslavatjavirkin. Um, but anyway, if you have a, no, it's, no, no I think it's Hedley's Haiti. Um, um, you have about 40,000 tons of CO2 emission that are generated by Hedley's Haiti. These 40,000 thousand tons are currently being considered to be recycled into methane production. So what you can do, you can use hydrogen produced by hydrolysis um, using, using electricity from maybe hydropower with a very low carbon footprint, and then co use the CO2 emitted from the geothermal power plant, combine it with hydrogen and produce synthetic methane. And synthetic methane is, is the same as, as natural gas, and which could be sold on the European market as carbon recycled natural gas. And if you argue that the entire carbon footprint of the 40,000 40, tons of CO2 are already allocated to the electricity produced from the Hedley's Haiti power plant, then you could argue that the methane plant produces um, um, using the CO2 from Hedley's Haiti 
um, is a carbon neutral or carbon free um, energy source. So you could sell it um, on, on, the, on the natural gas market, but with a carbon footprint that is close to zero. There might be a little bit of transportation, but the transportation um, is gonna be a very small um, amount regarding to the total um, um, to the total carbon footprint of the production. However, it's a bit more complicated because in Headless Haiti now they started to do the card fix project. So part of the CO2 is re-injected into the ground. And so part of the CO2 um, cannot be allocated anymore. It does not have to be allocated anymore to the electricity production or the um, uh, thermal heat production. And so then it becomes more complex how to allocate um, the different, um, the, the carbon emissions from the, from the headless Haiti power plant. So the point I wanna make with this is that it's not always easy to define a functional unit where you can allocate the CO2 emissions from one factory to one product because frequently you have several products, like in this case, for example, methane, um, district heating and electricity. And then you have to come up with a clever way of how you can allocate the carbon footprint to those three different topics, products. Um, same is of course true for Swartzenki, the power plant we looked before where you have um, the Blue Lagoon just next to it. There it's a question of discussion and um, there are different approaches that you can use to allocate the carbon footprint of Swartzenki to either the Blue Lagoon, the electricity production, district heating, or even maybe to some of the cosmetic products uh, produced, um, pr produced there. Um, so this leads me to a project, a real life project that I've been working on in Switzerland, where I looked at biogas buses where um, biogas was produced in the local sewage treatment plant from biomass. We will have a special day on biomass um, um, next week where we have a, um, um, a start, uh, uh, a, uh, um, the director of a startup company in Reykjavik to come to talk about bi biomass. But if you produce methane from biogas, of course, then this biogas is almost CO2 free because the same amount of CO2 to produce the methane is used as is being used if you drive around with biogas with a, with a, with a bus uh, around. Similar cases now is this the case with the biogas that it is produced in Sorpa in the landfill just outside of Reykjavik. If you buy biogas from Sorpa, you can consider yourself that this is carbon neutral um, fuel, if you drive with a biogas car through Reykjavik, um, your carbon balance would be close to zero because the emissions from, by burning the biogas um, is carbon free because the same amount of CO2 is assimilated in the biomass to produce the methane in the, in the reactor. Please feel free to write me a question if you would like a if you would like to comment on one of the figures or one of my statements um, because I'm, I'm just talking here and, <laughs> and uh, I, I can't see you so if you don't write me questions or comments then I will just continue talking and um, uh, go on with the with the lecture what time is it now it's oh it's already two o'clock so I see that I I'm again a little bit over time um, um, so I'm gonna maybe skip a bit quicker through this scoping. We discussed it already. That this is where you define um, the relevant aspects of your project, um, um, where you um, consider alternative. Um, yeah, we just think of what is relevant, what is not. Is groundwater relevant in this particular case or not? So you go through your project and think of um, what are the relevant um, aspects that you should take a closer look into. Consider alternatives. Um, for example, here in this case, they build a bridge and they considered an alternative for the bridge um, with making the bridge go um, outside the residential area in order to decrease the noise emission um, of, 
of, from the traffic. So you can use, of course, ArcGIS to look at the alternatives. So this is an alternative for electric um, um, uh, cables crossing a residential area where you can look into what are sensitive areas where you should not touch and then you can identify alternatives that, that look better. For the construction of bridges, um, sometimes people might uh, con be concerned about the visual impacts. Um, and the, like here in the example of the bridges, there are th four different examples um, where people, where you can do then a, a surveys, what, which, which version has the least visual impact and is the least knowing um, about um, the uh, impacting on the landscape. In Iceland, um, one big concern is always the, also the visual impacts of power lines in the highlands because as um, some people are very um, concerned about preserving the wilderness of the Icelandic wilderness. So there was a, an architect who came up with this idea to create very artistic power lines, like in this example. So it's, it's, it's uh, worth the discussion if an, uh, if an alternative of power line like this um, could be a, a, a good solution to, um, to ease a bit the impacts, the visual impacts on the landscape. Of course, it will still be an impact because you still can see the power lines, but maybe by giving them a, some artistic flair, um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a less negative impact. But, um, yeah. Okay, a Kauron Yukar hydropower plant um, um, is also, of course, a, a visual impact, but there you have, of course, also the flooding area of the uh, um, highlands behind it, which has an um, even bigger in. Oh, yeah, the reason why I bring this up because Kauron Yukar was actually an alternative to another location, which was a little bit more to the east and um, when, when this other location was heavily disputed in, um, um, by, by many Icelanders, um, the, the, the operators came up with this idea to create the uh, carbon yucca just in the next valley. So in principle, carbon yucca was an alternative to a an, um, previously um, submitted project, uh, which was finally then, um, well, they agreed to build it. It was still um, quite disputed at the time, um, but at least the, the point I want to make is that current Yukar was also a alternative to a, in a previously submitted environmental impact um, statement. Um, so understanding and documenting. So understanding and documenting, this is really where you do your inventory, you describe the five W's um, and the pros um, and what your project is all about. Um, where, for example, if you were to take the example of Atlas AD again, like you had before, here you would have to describe um, how the energy, where the energy comes from, where the CO2 comes from, how much of the CO2 comes from and how much of the CO2 goes into the carb fix project, how much emissions come from the methane plant and what is the transport of the methane um, towards, towards other markets and what is the water pollution um, in, in the project. So in principle, it's just the inventory where you list all the data that is relevant for, for your project. Mm. In the book that I mentioned before and that is also in the Dropbox, you can see some examples of um, sand and gravel queries um, where they put up um, uh, maps like this where you, where you can also show the dimensions, the, the spatial dimensions of a project, where you can describe what, how the project will impact the, the landscape in various different scenarios. Flow charts can be very um, useful to describe your projects where you have um, a little flow charts where you describe um, visually how the energy is being sorted or how um, the uh, material fluxes go um, uh, um, into it. An example of a material flow chart is for example here for Switzerland, we described this in, uh, um, um, this, this was a project I worked on 
It, it looked at uh, lead recycling in Switzerland where we described in a flow chart the amount of lead that comes into Switzerland, the amount of lead that goes into the production of products, and the amount of lead that goes fi finally into waste disposals, how much is released into the environment. So flow charts are a real good um, tool to describe visually how your products are going from one um, unit to the next unit. Mm. Of course, flow charts can be more, a lot more complex. Here, for example, for a refinery, where the flow chart becomes really complex and, um, and might even uh, include um, several sub flow charts where you go into detail about each individual process of a huge um, um, refinery, like the example here in Burghausen in Germany. Labor requirements, this goes into the social economic aspects um, where you can show um, how much labors your project will um, generate. Uh, important aspect to, to show this, um, that, that you um, might make, the, um, ma might make the, the society and the economy of a, of a, of a country more re resilient towards economic um, challenges by showing that you can employ labors that are um, independent of some of the um, uh, um, impacts that might affect some other economic areas. Mm. Um, yeah, so there, here's a checklist that you might go through when you go through your um, project, uh, project um, to see if you, um, that you don't miss any of those. And this is more or less what I would expect from the individual exercise when you write your inventory about your specific sphere that you uh, come up with a table where you describe your project, you have your reference functional unit and you describe how much um, is necessary to generate one megawatt of electricity uh, and then you put it in context of your, of your project. So this brings me to the short quiz. Um, Yang Shu, are you still here? Yes, I'm still here. Okay, we're gonna do the second quiz now, and then um, it's already 2.16, so maybe Yang Shu, you can start the quiz, and then we can do the... Okay, we have five people, seven people signed up. 18 people are signed up. Okay, then maybe 19 people are signed up, 20 people are signed up. We're gonna wait still a little bit longer and then we can just go ahead with the quiz. Okay, so we start, maybe we can start with the first question. Which of the following is a life cycle phase of a product? Extraction of raw materials, product use, final disposal, all of them. Of course, the life cycle um, phases of a product, exactly, it's all of them. Uh, you got this all correct, um, very good. And who was the fastest? Um, so we have a new leader with vitamin D with a hamburger was the fastest uh, with 984 points, one point ahead of um, class finish at 1 p.m. Okay, 1 p.m. <laughs> okay, class finish at 1 p.m. was second fastest. So, um, mm. so what is the purpose of the functional unit? 
it describes resources used per unit output unit. It makes the environmental impact assessment function. It produces a unit for environmental parameters. It is a legislative term used used in course are uh, used in courts, in courts, probably. So I think the only answer that fits is, of course, it describes res resources used per unit output. And I didn't fully see the third answer, but we have Class finish at 1 p.m. <laughs> um, um, is drop the drop back because probably the question answer three um, was a bit. Um, um, but we have Lorenzo again, who was fastest and who's taking the lead again. So we have question three. Which method is used to compare the total environmental impacts of a product? Life cycle assessment, environmental impact statement. Um, what was RS? Was none of them is the last 22 are answered. Yes, of course, it's the life cycle assessment because there you go through the entire life cycle of a product and you assess the, um, the environmental impacts um, compared, compared to the, um, for a specific output. So Lorenzo took the lead, uh, is still in the lead, followed by Chloe um, and with Loco 2, the erupting volcano icon in third position. And then we have question four out of six. Considering the energy consumption, which kind of bulb, light bulb is most sustainable? Um, yeah, so the conventional one with the little, okay, it's already over. 22 have correctly answered. It's of course the LED lamp which is the most efficient one and who uh, I think we have a new leader or no it's still the same leader L Lorenzo is still in the lead with almost 450 points ahead of Chloe followed by Loco are still a tight race and I think we have one more question right no two more questions question five oh, Question five out of six. Um, which of the following is not an environmental impact of nuclear power? CO2 emitted during the construction, CO2 emitted while transporting material waste, CO2 emitted while operating, radioactive waste produced during the operation. Okay, one more second left. Um, yeah, I think here we have to um, proceed by elimination and the CO2 emitted while operation is for sure the least and there might still be a little bit CO2 emitted, but um, since, it's, since it's a thermal power plant where the fuel does not emit directly CO2, the CO2 emissions are very low. So you could argue that there is very little CO2 emission from nuclear power while the operation phase. But for sure during the construction and the, um, there's a lot of, there might be some CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. So I think um, who Chloe took the lead and is with almost a hundred points in the lead. And we have only one question left. So will Loco, to um, be able to get to the pod, uh, first place. Who is the president of the European Commission? 
Angela Merkel, Charles Michael, David Sassoli, or Ursula von der Leyen. Of course, it's Ursula von der Leyen who is the president of the European Commission. David Sassoli is the president of the European Parliament. Charles Michael is the president of the European Council and Angela Merkel is the um, prime minister of Germany. So um, we will see who got this correctly. Um, I think Temu from Finland got answered this most fastest and made it up to the poe, podium, but Chloe is the winner. Congratulations to Chloe. Um, we will end the lectures today. I know there are some slides still left, but I'm gonna go over them on Thursday. Um, it's, uh, there too, it's, it's not much that is left. You can also take a look into it. It's mostly about um, the communication. <clears throat> so, um, so I look forward to meeting you Thursday. If you have questions regarding your project, feel free to write me a mail. We can um, meet in the afternoon and um, or or we can meet them um, also tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow there will be a lecture on geothermal energy, environmental impacts on geothermal energy by Jon, uh, um, Einar Jon Aspjörsson. Um, he's a colleague of mine and he will address specifically geothermal energy, environmental impacts of geothermal energy um, tomorrow. So uh, thank you very much. If you have questions, feel free to contact me um, by mail and then we can set up a Skype meeting and discuss your projects. Otherwise, we would meet tomorrow again, same time, same Zoom link um, and have a nice afternoon. Thank you.